Good morning, good day, good afternoon, everyone listening on this discussion today. Uh, my name is Joan, I work for Avencia, and today I feel extra privileged to have been asked to, to moderate this panel of four very experienced business leaders within e-commerce. Um, all four of them are deeply involved in respective company online businesses and also has been very involved in the process of platform selection uh, to implementation and optimization of their online business. So with, uh, with um, no further ado, I would like to introduce first Philip uh, Elberhoy, who's a co-founder of The Green Deal, a company that focuses on taking care of returns and making retail more sustainable and more cost uh, efficient. Um, I would say it's a win-win concept there. Uh, second, uh, Michael Evald Hansen, welcome, e-commerce director at Lacris by Bulov, a company that helps people in many countries to feed their craving for high-end licorice. And a special thank you for that. And uh, Jacob Rastad, uh, COO at Nordic Nest, a company that provides all the corners of the world with that clean, crisp, and distinctive Scandinavian design we all love. And last but definitely not least, Matthew Woosley, global president for a company called 66 North, which are in the apparel and fashion industry for winter clothing with the slogan, keeping Iceland warm since 1926, which I personally would say is a testament that they have done a really good job. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to dive into a range of questions that we have that will be very interesting to hear from you guys and your experience. And the first question is, is basically what was the reason why you started looking for a new platform? And uh, let's start with Michael. And, and could you also briefly tell us where you are in your replatforming project right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we um, we have a long we have an e-commerce journey over the last six or seven years. Started off briefly on a Shopify platform and moved to a bigger platform in 2017. That that was not a great success for us. Uh, so we actually a few years back built on a proprietary uh, a monolithic approach to to uh, to get a move on. And um, about twelve months ago, we decided to to look for a new new platform because we are a Build an omni-channel retailer. We do online, wholesale, and retail. And um, we started seeing uh, op opportunity to open warehouses in different parts of the world and starting to see more complexity around our business. Um, so that uh, lim was limited by the platform that we were previously on. And that is why we, uh, we started looking uh, elsewhere, uh, in this case, in the headless uh, sphere. So that was uh, exciting. Thank you. And I know, Philip, for you, it wasn't really a replatforming project. It was the start of a new business adventure, if I understand that right. Uh, where in the roadmap of creating a new business did you start looking for a future platform? Is, is this early or, or a later decision? How did that uh, decision um, go for you? Of course, the idea came first, but uh, quite uh, fast we, we went into the tech stack because um, it is kind of based on technology and uh, an innovating way of using technology to, to make new business processes. So it was quite early that we uh, started looking at different kind of uh, platforms. And uh, when we ended up on commerce tools, it's kind of, it's not the maybe the obvious choice for a startup, but uh, when you have uh, a, a, a global um, vision uh, you need to have a, a solid foundation and there are also quite experienced people on board so uh, we went for a really really solid fundament for our solution we want to be sure that you don't have to plat re-platform within two years from now yeah definitely and when you are so lucky that you can start from scratch uh, that most people will envy um, then uh, you you must choose wisely. <laughs> of course. How about you, Jacob? What what made Nordic Nest look for, for a new platform? Yeah, so so we were actually preparing for for continued growth and and had uh, not outgrown our, our current platform, but but we knew that we weren't going to be able to scale in that way we, that we wanted uh, in our current. Uh, so we decided just before the, the COVID <laughs> pandemic to 
that we need to be able to scale up quickly. Uh, and then the pandemic hit, and we sort of just rocked it uh, through it. So, so uh, we thought that we were going to have a lot of time to be able to do the platform project and switch in, in a good manner. Uh, and now we sort of uh, uh, need to, to get it done quickly instead, uh, since, uh, since it's been just a, a crazy year for us. So, but but the 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 reason for for it was actually not just being being able to scale, uh, but also to increase speed uh, in development. So uh, we the current platform we have, which is a, a big brand platform, but it's it's a monolithic in in a monolith, monolith in in its architecture. Uh, which, uh, of course, is is good in some ways, but very bad in a lot of others. Uh, so we first decided on, on the, that we we going to use the headless approach uh, as a base for architecture, uh, and uh, started researching uh, all different kinds of, of platforms offering that. Uh, and then uh, in in that process, uh, ended up with with uh, commerce tools uh, later on. Uh, and actually partnered with, with you guys at, at Avensi as well. Okay. So uh, what, what would you say, um, Matthew, I mean, what was the most challenging part of finding and selecting a new platform? And, and if you were to give one piece of advice to someone who's in this process, what would that be? And, and at the same time, Matthew, I know that you have previous experience selecting between the giant platform vendors that's been around for a long time, but also looking into new, more... Uh, younger vendors on the market, uh, could you give some insight into that in, in that same answer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for us, you know, so much of what we were really prizing in terms of our journey that we're on, which is on a sort of uh, the nice part of a scaled growth at the moment, is having, I think, that flexibility uh, to create, I think, you know, to, to sort of focus on the, have, have the technology sort of focus on the pieces that could enable our customer experience across online, uh, retail and wholesale, but doing so in a way, I think, that didn't sort of box us in in one way or another, I think. Oftentimes, um, and I think has often been the case with sort of the larger uh, monolithic players, and which are in fact often legacy players as well, um, is, is that they have sort of enjoyed this reputation for uh, being highly scalable and configurable. Um, but actually, sort of, I think I think it's a bit of a false choice. Um, I think that uh, you know, so I think my advice in that regard, you know, having having worked with, implemented, or you know, sort of inherited uh, some of the some of the largest platforms that exist at different places, and now sort of moving over to something which is headless and more sort of nimble and flexible, is is actually that it's um, it's a bit of a false trade off uh, when it comes to looking at the capabilities. Um, when you actually think about the capabilities of what you can enable from a customer experience or from a business outcomes experience, uh, you know, it isn't just the case that uh, sort of the bigger monolithic players provide any sort of, go in my in my opinion, pro provide a go-to-market advantage, whether that's from a capability standpoint, uh, certainly not from a cost or ease of implementation standpoint. But, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, several of us have said here is really that sort of need so that need for speed really like how do you do things quickly and iterate quickly um how do you have humility about the fact that you know you're making this platform change but you don't know uh what the future will be in two to three years um you know i think if coronavirus in 2020 taught us anything it's that um so i think for me it's really that piece about you know prizing flexibility um you know and being able to i think not fall into the world of sort of uh, creating dichotomies uh, between big and small or, or, or new and old, just sort of actually evaluating on, on the basis so far as you can tell. So very much based on, on pricing and flexibility, which, which of course are two very important factors. But how about you, Michael? If, if I remember it correctly, you had done a lot of work in your previous platform. Uh, was these investments something that you hoped and wanted to transition into a new platform or was it time for a do-over basically and as you grow well um actually one of the beauties about moving to a headless platform is that a lot of some of the things that we already had built we could keep and the goal of our implementation uh, as a first step was actually to to go live with a completely revamped platform without anyone really knowing about it so we kept our front end uh, and uh, and switched out all of the uh, the e-commerce parts of the of the front end. So that's all the transactional, the product catalog, you know, the card checkout, etc. And we we virtually switched out the whole back end uh, without anyone taking notice because it was the same front end, 
it was just all the logic was changed and that gave us a, a big edge so that was a, that was a that was a nice way of transitioning out of a of a legacy platform that that, that had some intrigues that's nice and, and philip you you recently or just a couple of seconds ago mentioned that you you had the privilege of starting on a clean slate the white paper uh building a new business and all how did that affect your decision but but i also want to it's kind of interesting because headless isn't only e-commerce there are more and more systems popping up that are headless did you get an opportunity to select some kind of more or less headless erp system more or head, more or less headless pim system or, or other systems that kind of uh, fitted better into a headless architecture I think that uh, played uh, a crucial part in how we chose our solution uh, on the different sides. Um, uh, we may not have taken the headless part uh, in all uh, senses and all systems, but uh, the front end is kind of given. Um, uh, I guess we are very much about scale and uh, the be able to diversify from country to country as we need a local presence in each country we are so part of the um uh, part of the reason that we chose um, uh, commerce rules and go headless was to, to be able to be uh, local uh, but grow uh, global quite fast so to be able to add services in each country that are specific, but still have this engine in the middle that works globally was quite important to us. So that was kind of the, it was part of the challenge of the architecture to make this uh, scalable. And uh, as Matthew said, uh, the, the need for speed is of course vital. So, so, um, so I guess that's a main reason for why we chose as, uh, as we did. Thank you very much for that answer, Philip, because that's a perfect segue into my, my next question, which, which you basically already answered. And, and that's helped the audience here to cut through all the buzzwords and better understand more hands-on uh, what's the difference between monolithic and, and, and uh, monolithic, sorry, and headless composable e-commerce uh, and the key decisions around selecting that. So uh, Jacob, do, do you have any hands-on uh, examples on this is a typical monolithic system, not, not by name, more like function and what they do and don't do, and where the headless like solves the problem or what they do and don't do, that the main differences. Yeah, so, so I think a good example is, is uh, the, like the, the key takeaway when, when you're in a monolithic system, it's that you, you can't do changes uh, on just one part of the system without deploying the whole. Uh, so let's say that you have a dev team working on some uh, functionality on, on the front end on your PDP or, or whatever, and you have another team working on, let's say, integration or, or some backend functionality. And, and then you hear from the dev team that, oh, we cannot deploy this because this is in the pipeline first. Uh, then you sort of in a uh, normal, typical monolithic uh, setup. Uh, and, and that's sort of one one of the key takeaways, so one of the main reasons why uh, I think headless is the way to go, uh, not for all companies, because it, it does come with a whole set of uh, another headaches, of course, uh, but, but for companies that want to scale and want to grow, and especially companies that have the ability and want the, the, the high speed development. Uh, so, so in uh, in in the other end, in a headless architecture, you can have one team working on uh, on one feature, one product, or or one set of functionality without affecting the other. So you have decoupled uh, the, the the parts in your uh, in your platform, uh, and and that's the the uh, main important thing with with going headless. Yeah, I can totally see that. Is there anyone else uh, on the panel here that has another great example of, of what is a typical headless monolithic difference, except from the, I would say, agility that, that Jacob kind of uh, sums it up to? I think I would like to add something because I, I think oftentimes when talking about headless, a lot of people, it, it, it can be a buzzword, headless in, on its own, and it's not an inherently new thing per se. It's actually, I think it's Dirk, the founder of Commercial that coined the offer about uh, eight or eight or nine years ago. But what I think differentiates commerce tools in so many ways is that, you know, Connecting APIs is nothing new. Uh, so many companies have been doing this for the last 25 years or 20 years almost. Um, and, but what Commerce Tools provides is, is a feature set 
you know, it's it's a feature set that's based on these microservices and these APIs, and and they give you the opportunity to customize and compose it in any way you want to. So you build the logic around the platform. You don't change the way the platform core works, but you you extend it and you you work with how the platform. Uh, uh, what what they offer you, and that's the that's the main differentiator. So it's much faster to to make small additions or changes or deploy new code to part of uh, your your API than having to to edit the whole solution. Thank you. Um, so we talked about the platform selection process, but after you select the platform, you, you need to, to get it up and running, implement it basically. And, and let's talk about project and implementation partner. Again, what is the one key piece of advice that you can give to someone that's going through a project like this, going into a project like this? Could be how do you run a project like this yourself, like Philip does? Um, what, what would the expectations on a partner be? And how do you staff in parallel with your day-to-day -day operations? And, and uh, have Matthew start answering that question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, in terms of uh, our journey, I mean, we're we're lucky to have an implementation partner that we've worked with in the past. Uh, we're very keen on. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the things maybe paradoxically that's nice is is that I actually found quite exciting was is that. Um, development teams, I think, depending on, you know, there's a certain, uh, a certain sort of development, agile development teams that sort of love the idea of doing uh, headless e-commerce implementations. And so I think, you know, we were able to do a lot of development, I think, where the team itself is just really excited. Um, so I think, you know, without going into too much of the project management piece, I mean, I think it's one of those things where, for me, at least, uh, one of the sort of pleasures of this process, which for us, and we launched, uh, I guess, September of last year, um, after really about a sort of six to seven month uh, implementation, um, you know, it was just really that, you know, that sort of palpable level of excitement, because I think the, the developers who were working on the project, um, you know, had spent so much of their time and careers in sort of large monolithic applications. And I think, you know, some of the things that Jacob's describing and Michael are describing around, you know, ways in which uh, flexibility, uh, you know, being streamlined in terms of your process, being able to sort of also, I mean, amazing, you know, amazingly de-risk things. I mean, we were able to launch, just like Michael was saying, core pieces of, of the e-commerce journey in the background without changing the front end um, and doing these things in a way that, uh, you know, both, I mean, it's sort of funny to be exciting to the development team, which is always great. And you get a lot more out of everybody. Um, but also at the same time, you know, you're really de-risking um, and improving business processes as you go. And I think internally, in terms of that management, both for technical and non-technical stakeholders, the fact that you can deploy things and deploy things quickly um, and see the sort of straightaway uh, results of those deployments and changes, um, I think really sort of, I think, builds momentum in the company and again, across all strata, you know, so it's not just this thing that the technology team goes away and does uh, for six to eight months, uh, and then drops. <laughs> it's this thing that sort of everyone can follow along with, and I think I think it creates a greater sense of um, you know sort of inclusion and excitement within the company. At least it did in ours. Oh, that makes sense, definitely, definitely. So uh, Jacob, on the same theme, how do you match the running a project like this? with your day-to-day -day operations. I mean, you probably have an e-commerce manager or those type of roles that that's hopefully is, is a full-time job. On top of that, they now need to help the partner elicit requirements. They need to, to run this project. Did you have to staff with extra people? Did you have to reallocate resources? And then how did that work to keep your day-to-day -day business going and accelerating? Yes, so so that's always uh, hard and and, and, and uh, very tough to to manage. And uh, the you know the, the best from from like a management perspective, the, the best thing that you want to do is just you know up the team, uh, so you can do both. Uh, but but you you also have key players, or key individuals that you need to be like uh, uh, fully uh, in 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 the in the project and cannot do other things uh, on the side. And those are often hard to replace. So so you need to sort of accept that you will need to uh, uh, um, slow down uh, in, in development of other areas in the meantime. 
uh, we were actually ma uh, managed to, to during this project, uh, both uh, implement a new WMS system for the warehouse, a new PIM system, uh, a new RMS system for our returns, uh, and uh, also a OMS system for our customer service. Uh, and, and the way we managed to do that was both, the, uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, uh, not technical, but but uh, uh, people with a good technical understanding. So not tech people, but but uh, a good understanding of tech uh, with a, a very good sense of the business and and, and uh, business processes involved in those projects. Uh, and then working with with both a good in-house tech development team and also uh, the, the main reason why we were able to do this all of these things so fast was uh, that we also had uh, very good partners to work with. Uh, so, so uh, uh, if you want to do it with a partner, you, the, the partner selection is, is of course crucial. And, and when you find find a good one, you you tend to hold on to. Uh, so, so yeah. So you basically did brain and heart surgery at the same time. That that's pretty impressive. Um, Philip, you, um, as we said before, uh, you kind of started on a clean slate. Uh, all the other guys on the panel here, they came into a project with knowing that this were the pains in my old platform, this is how we do business, let's translate that into new requirements and updated business processes and get that into a new platform. Now, you've been around the block before when it comes to e-commerce and so forth, but you're creating all of this for a new business. How did that affect your way of, of defining your, your, your requirements, basically, and what to build and how to build it? Because you were kind of on new grounds, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, as you mentioned, I've been working with a lot of different uh, e-com solutions before, uh, both large ones and, and, and smaller ones. And you think you know what you want, but <laughs> you have to take a bit of a beating here anyway. Uh, now I'm quite lucky because, or unlucky, and uh, depends on how you look upon it, but I'm on both sides of the table because um, as um, um, also digital is now developing the, the Green Deal solution uh, and uh, are specializing in within e-commerce. And uh, I work there as well. So I'm sitting on both sides of the table so I have no one to blame uh, if it goes wrong. But um, anyway, back to your question, it's um, you always learn something new and you think you thought of it all, but you never had. So you are you're, you're, um, really in the hands of a good team. You will need that, that experienced team on all levels of the e-commerce solution. And uh, what I'm leaning more and more against is that need people that are experienced both in the e-commerce matters and the tech stuff together. Uh, and I think almost every supplier of solutions are going in that direction. And I think that's about time because there's been too much silos between um, communication bureaus, uh, crow experts or and tech and development teams. So. Um, I think also the way that you develop on a headless platform makes that even a bit easier. Although one learning, you need to keep control of your microservices. I think that's my <laughs> bottom line there. I see some people nodding to what you're saying right there. Uh, could you be more precise about that? Do you have any good example? Is it just not making microservices for everything and don't really document it, or is it? <laughs> um, no, I, I think you summed it up there. Um, it's easy to make a lot of new microservices and not thinking about how you should take care of them after the production setting. Who is responsible? How well are they documented? How are they um, uh, what's it called? It's uh, like uh, sorted or organized. Mm -hmm. uh, how well thought through. I've been in companies that we had over five, six hundred different uh, microservices for a front end, and and uh, others that are happy with uh, under under fifty. Yeah. And in both scenarios, you need to be have someone that are really on top of that, not just on the tech side, but also on the business side, understanding this. 
because uh, that can uh, be quite costful if you lose control of that and and can drive development costs but it also can be very cost saving when you have control of them it makes sense it makes sense and also differ between what you actually need and what you want and what you kind of wish for and something the moscow model so uh, now we talked about selecting a platform we're talking about the needs you had and why you selected the platform we talk about partner and project the next natural step in this is, is going live so you'll be working on this and you want to go live uh, in many cases um this could be your primary say channel uh, it could be your only um what do you call it? Only, only a, a, a channel of food or bread, put bread on the table. And it, it can make it pretty intense uh, and, and require a lot of planning. How do you plan for that uh, to secure a smooth transition? How do you ensure everything from traffic, SEO, revenues, getting the staff trained? Um, if we start with, with Matthew, do you have any specific example around that that, that was important for you guys and, and that you put extra time and effort into ensure? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, I, mean, I think the aspects of um, as sort of the de-risking aspects that I mentioned earlier, where within a few months of, of our project, we were able to put things uh, live primarily around, uh, I mean, payments, uh, order processes, product information. I mean, I think those things for us, I think, because e-commerce is such a huge part of our business that, you know, having that ability to de-risk so many parts of the project was just such a huge importance. I mean, I think... Um, you know, the other thing that we really probably spent the, a lot of time on was also localization in terms of language localization and region localization. Um, and that's that's where I think, you know, in terms of the ways in which that's, I always feel like that's where everything sort of either comes together or it doesn't, <laughs> you know, because that's when you that's when you start mixing a lot of variables and customer driven variables and also selections around, you know, the, uh, the configurations of I'm in this country, but I want to see it in this language and I want to read about it and, you know, this and I want to use these payment providers and those payment providers aren't available in that region. And I always feel like that's the that's the great test <laughs> of the of the strategy and the and the architecture of what you've put forth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I we we intentionally, I think, put a lot of time into that and, and made a good deal of allowance for it. Um, so I think that would always just be my piece to those who are doing uh, international e-commerce and especially outside of different regions. So outside of, you know, Europe or outside of, um, you know, one single continent is, is that um, ensuring that you spend enough time and create enough time within your project plan to uh, deal with all of those thorny issues. Um, but it is at the same time, it's where it's where elements of, of uh, you know, your microservices that really have that opportunity to shine. So. Interesting. Now, how about you, Michael? Um, going live with the solution in, in your countries or going live with the solution in general? Uh, what's your take and what can you share? With well, that? I mean, going live with something is always daunting. Um, and you can only prepare as much as you can. Uh, you know, uh, I'm... I would say testing, testing, testing. What we did uh, in the months up to uh, our launch, you know, map out every single integration, every single feature that we made, just make one big, huge, uh, be it a, uh, an Excel sheet or whatever you want to. We use uh, Notion for some of these things. Made a huge uh, list, you know, uh, a, a couple of developers and I, you mapped out some, some testing you could do for each of these uh, areas and then just uh, start having the extended team and also people that are not necessarily close to the project, you know, start testing these things because once you get more people uh, with other eyes on it, they start finding things and they start testing or trying things that you haven't really thought about. And they go, hmm, why is this doing that? And then you go back and you can then iterate and you can, you can mix it up. And we spent, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of hours on testing in the in the month up to, uh, so just to make sure that everything works, and we we actually launched flaw, uh, quite flawlessly with almost no errors, and uh, and then be prepared to iterate fast after launch if something is wrong, and that's the one of the advantages with the headless approach is that you can fix things quite rapidly. Um, and that's uh, we actually went live with a, a, a payment integration that worked a little bit differently than we anticipated. So we, after we went live with one mark, we quickly built a new integration in five days, 
and had the the other uh, six markets go live in the in the in the in the ten days after that. So That's that was interesting. You could quickly, you know, quickly iterate and quickly uh, adjust. Okay, we're we're running out of time here, but we have one single last question, which I would like to hear from everyone. A very short and brief answer. Uh, try if you can keep it to ten seconds each. What's the next step? We start with uh, Philip. Launching these days. So no more questions about that, please. Okay, <laughs> Matthew. Uh, for us, it's uh, the CR figuring out the right priorities between CRM development and the uh, backlog. <laughs> All right, Jacob. Yeah, launching and finish launching, <laughs> and uh, after that, it's uh, uh, so much development uh, that we want to do to so just to get going. And Michael. Yes, we are uh, making the new warehouse integrations, uh, integrating to the US, you could say sales taxes, you know, uh, warehousing, et cetera. And then we're building a loyalty concept uh, that uh, is custom made on commercials. That's nice. That's nice. So I got a couple of keywords from, from this uh, panel, and it's been a great and very educational. I would say a couple of things about this platform and that this approach is, is a work step by step. You have the ability to work step by step. You can be very agile. So work agile and, and use that agility. Keep track of your microservices. Don't um, write too much at first. You can do it step by step and don't overdo it. Um, testing, 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 go live, testing, 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 and it could be less of a pain to go live and iterate fast. After you go live, iterate fast. Your project isn't over because you go live. You can go live fast and then iterate after that. It's been a pleasure speaking with you guys and, and I thank you very much for your time and um, I hope to be able to speak to you once again in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>